Good afternoon, and thank you for joining our conversation today on GDPR regulations as it relates to the shipping and logistics industry. My name is Elizabeth Lowe, and I'm a senior associate in Venable's International Trade and Logistics Group in Washington, D.C., and I'm joined today by my colleague, Shannon. Thanks, Liz. I am Shannon Yavorsky. I am a partner in Venable's San Francisco office in the privacy and cybersecurity team, and I have uh, been doing European data protection work for the better part of 15 years, and obviously the landscape has changed pretty significantly since I started doing this kind of work, and we hope to give you a good presentation today on how the new law will apply to the shipping and logistics industry. Before we begin, uh, a few housekeeping items to cover. First, for the best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background that could cause issues. Webinars are bandwidth intensive, so closing unnecessary browser tabs will help conserve your bandwidth. The webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned up and the volume is up so you can hear us. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets you can use. All the widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to adjust them to get the most out of your de desktop space. And finally, if you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. We will try to answer these questions during the webcast, but to the extent that we don't get to them, if we run out of time, we will respond to you via email. So with that, let's get started. Great. Thanks so much, Liz. Um, so we're going to give you a high level overview of some of the concepts in the GDPR, but also do a deeper dive into issues that are more specific to the uh, shipping and logistics industry. So the General Data Protection Regulation replaces the EU Data Protection Directive that's been in force for a long time. The directive was, uh, by virtue of it being directive, had to be implemented into national law in Europe, which meant that there was a patchwork of 31 different laws relating to data protection in Europe. So the General Data Protection Regulation, because it's a regulation, has direct effect, meaning that the member states uh, don't have to uh, implement the law. The key principles under the General Data Protection Regulation are very similar to those in the directive, but there are slight differences and new features that have been added, which we'll talk through during the course of this presentation. So uh, the key principles are transparency, you need to provide a privacy notice to individuals. There are uh, rights of data subjects, which is very similar to the directive, but there are enhanced rights uh, under the regulation. Accountability for data controllers and data processors. Data protection officers may need to be appointed, and data protection impact assessments may need to be conducted. Data security and data breach features, some of these are new uh, for European data protection legislation the election of a supervisory authority, and international data transfers. Although I note that the regime with respect to cross-border data transfer has not changed significantly since the, since the directive. So moving on uh, to some of the core concepts, the definition of personal data under the GDPR is broader than it was under the, under the directive, and it's any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. And it's anything that can be used indirectly, directly or indirectly uh, by reference to an identifier, including an ID number, location data, or online identifier. And this is a difference from the directive. The GDPR specifically calls out online identifiers, such as device IDs and cookie identifiers, as explicitly being personal data. So this is an interesting point, Shannon, um, how broad exactly is personal data? So for example, um, if you're shipping a vehicle, the transportation company will generally collect uh, a VIN number for that vehicle. Could a VIN number be considered personal data? That's a great question. So personal data can include data that on its own is nothing, but when combined with other information can be used to identify someone. And that's why there's very, lim uh, very little to limit what constitutes personal data under the GDPR. 
As to VIN numbers, in isolation, they tell us arguably very little, but together with a logbook, it can tell us who the person is, where they live, what car they drive, the specification of the car. And from this information, we may be able to derive other information, and that could be you know, valuable to an organization. So the VIN number would be considered personal data for the purposes of the GDPR. And if the EU person that's involved in a transaction is actually a company as opposed to a natural person, um, what type of data would be considered personal data when, as it relates to a company? So that's a great question. I think there are two points to make there. One is that we get a lot of questions about, oh, well, I'm just interfacing with a company. It's just business to business. But when you're thinking about the individuals at that organization, you're liaising with an, uh, a person at the company's email address, and that constitutes personal data for the purposes of the GDPR. I think the second part of the equation is that there are uh, company entities that may not be have been considered personal data. In certain jurisdictions, a company entity will fall within the scope of personal data, and I think that's an important distinction. And it's something that you know, while I said that the GDPR is a regulation that has direct effect, there are some areas in which member states can uh, supplement the GDPR. And the scope of personal data is, is one of them. So it's something to keep an eye on. Do you have any recommendations for how companies should deal with these disparities between member states? So it's a really great question, and not all member states have issued their supplemental legislation at this point. So I think it's really important to keep an eye on uh, on the legislation that's coming out of Europe and on the supervisory authorities in each jurisdiction uh, to make sure you know when the, the new law is coming into force and to make any adjustments that need to be made to your practices based on the, the new member state law. Um, so another uh, core concept that I wanted to talk about uh, today was the distinction between a data controller and a data processor for the purposes of the GDPR. And these were concepts that existed under the Data Protection Directive, and they, they carry over to the regulation. And they're, they're really terms of art, and they're, you, I, I know a lot of clients have, it, have trouble wrapping their head around what each of them means. So a data controller is the entity that alone or jointly with others determines the purposes and means of the processing of personal data. When you think about a data controller, it, you think about the entity that has primary, primarily the primary responsibility for collecting the data, establishing a lawful basis of processing, uh, determining the data retention period, whereas a data processor is the person that processes data on behalf of the data controller. So the great example of a data processor is a cloud service provider. They simply store the data uh, on behalf of a data controller. But the reason that this distinction is important is because it will inform the data processing agreements that you may need to enter into with third parties. So I think it might be helpful to um to consider a couple of hypotheticals that take into account um, the realities of the shipping and logistics industry. Um, first, for an intermodal shipment to an individual in the EU, um, a logistics company collects personal data on that individual in the EU, the consignee, address, name, et cetera. The logistics company then passes that information to a motor carrier that's gonna provide the door delivery service in the EU. In that scenario, what role is the logistics company playing? Got it. So let me unpack that a little bit. It's, it's difficult to determine which entity acts as a controller and processor, so it's really important to determine what each party in the chain is doing with the data. If it's simply using the data to carry out instructions provided to it by another party, then it's more likely to be a data processor. So in this scenario, the logistics company appears to be collecting the personal data, likely the name and address of the consignee in the EU, and decides what to do with the data in order to carry out its contract, is likely to be considered a data controller. As to the motor carrier, provided it simply acts on the instructions of the logistics company and doesn't use the data for any other purpose, it's more likely to be acting as a data processor. So in that scenario, um, you would have the logistics company 
would have to enter into a data processing agreement uh, with the motor carrier that establishes the uh, logistics company status as a controller um, and the motor carrier's status as a data processor. So expanding on that hypothetical a little bit and adding in, for example, a U.S. company um, that is advertising goods to EU persons. They um, receive an order from somebody in the EU, obtain personal data from that individual, um, name, address, et cetera, in order to effectuate the order. The U.S. company engages a transportation provider to ship the goods to the EU person and provides the personal data to that transportation company. The transportation company in turn provides the personal data to a motor carrier for door delivery for the last leg. Um, in this case, based on my understanding mm -hmm. of what we've talked about this far, um, it seems clear to me that the U.S. company would be a data controller because mm -hmm. they're the ones who are who have obtained that data, they're deciding what to do with it in order to effectuate their contract with the EU person. And it seems that the motor carrier would still be a data processor as they're just receiving the data um, and being directed how to use it. In that instance, how is the logistics company acting? Are they a data processor, a data controller? Are they both? That's a great question. So. I think you're right in your instincts that the first company, the U.S. company, is likely to be a data controller in this scenario. And we're going to go on to uh, for later on in the presentation about why this U.S. U.S. based company would be caught by the GDPR. But so for this example, uh, the U.S. company is caught by the GDPR since it's advertising services to individuals in Europe. It's the first collector of the data and passes it along to the logistics provider. So the U.S. company is likely to be the controller. The logistics company that sits under that is likely to be a processor. And then the extent to which the logistics company passes the data on to the motor carrier, it's likely to be a subprocessor. In papering this agreement, the U.S. company would enter into a controller to processor data processing agreement with the logistics company. And the logistics company would enter into a processor to subprocessor agreement with the motor carrier which seems like a lot of different agreements in place, which is why it's really important to look at what each party in the chain is doing with the data and who they're engaged by. So uh, that brings us on to our next, our next topic, which is the extraterritorial applicability of the GDPR. And this is one that we get a lot of questions about. The GDPR applies to organizations that are established in Europe. So if there's an office agency or branch in Europe, then the GDPR applies. But it also applies to non-EU-based organizations. And this is a change from the Data Protection Directive and something that has been the subject of a fair bit of confusion. So where there, the organization has no EU presence, the GDPR will still apply if Number one, the, um, the organization is offering goods or services to individuals who are in Europe, or the organization uh, monitors the behavior of individuals in Europe. When we talk about monitoring behavior, we're looking at things like tracking individuals across the internet. And that one is aimed more at the ad tech ecosystem. So it's really relevant to the shipping and logistics industry. It's that first limb of the equation that may be relevant here is where there is no EU presence, but the organization is offering goods or services to individuals in Europe. Um, so when you're looking at whether there is an offer of goods or services to individuals in Europe, there are a number of gr different criteria that are considered. And the GDPR talks about the first one is whether it's apparent that the organization envisages, so intends to offer goods or services to individuals in Europe. And then there are a number of different criteria um, that have come out of case law and are in the recitals of the GDPR. And they are things like, does the website display prices in EU currency? Is there the use of an EU language on the website? Is the activity international? Is there a mention of phone numbers with an international dialing code? 
is there a top level domain in the EU, so a .co.uk or, or .fr? Um, is there a mention of international clientele composed of customers that are domiciled in different member states? Is there marketing activities that are directed towards the EU? So are you sending out marketing email to people in member states? Uh, and then, do you have any European intellectual property registered? So do you make any European filings, intellectual property or otherwise? So these are all things that will be weighed up in the determination as to whether the organization falls within the remit of the, of the GDPR. And Shannon, this question of whether the GDPR applies, is this looked at on a transaction by transaction basis, or is it more of a... Of wholesome look at the company's activities? That's a really good question. And this is one that we get a lot as well, because a lot of organizations say, well, you know, we are based in the U.S., but every once in a while we get uh, someone makes an order, uh, files an order for, for us from us in the U.S. Are we caught by the GDPR? And the assessment is is more subjective. So it looks at, again, if there is a presence in Europe, you're caught, or if there is no EU presence, whether any of these um, any of these criteria are met. So is there an offer of goods or services to individuals in Europe? Were you advertising to, to individuals in, in Europe? And that will sort of inform your decision as to whether the GDPR will apply to the organization. So again, a couple of hypotheticals um, focusing on this question of whether services are being offered in the in the EU. Um, for an export from the U.S., so a company in the U.S. is exporting to a person in the EU. Um, if a U.S. transportation company is engaged by the U.S. exporter, um, they did not offer their services to the EU person if they were offered to the U.S. exporter. Um, the U.S. transportation company obtains the name and address of the person in the EU, the EU consignee, uh, from the U.S. company, the U.S. exporter. Is the U.S. logistics company subject to the GDPR even though it didn't itself offer services into the EU? Right, and they're still processing the data of individuals in the, in the EU. That's a great that's a great question. So, looking at the substance of the relationship, the U.S. logistics company in this scenario doesn't appear to have made any offer of goods or services to individuals in Europe. However, if the U.S. based exporter is offering goods or services to individuals in Europe and is caught by the GDPR then it's, it's on the hook for the GDPR. It may insist uh, on the execution of a controller to processor data processing agreement with the U.S.-based logistics company. And just because it signs the data processing agreement doesn't mean that the U.S. logistics company is caught by the GDPR. It has to comply with the terms of the agreement, but it doesn't draw the logistics company within the remit of the, of the GDPR. It doesn't otherwise have to comply with the larger features of the GDPR. Okay. And sort of flip that a little bit, um, same scenario essentially where you've got an, an export from the United States, the U.S. company is the one who is um, offering its goods into the EU. This time the transportation company is itself based in the EU, but its services that it's selling are to the U.S. company. Um, does that logistics company fall within the GDPR. Got it. So the EU-based logistics company is processing U.S. personal data. So the EU-based company is caught by the GDPR because it is the first limb that it's based in Europe. It has an office agency or branch there, but it's processing the data of a U.S. individual. So they wouldn't necessarily have to apply the protections of the GDPR to the U.S. individual's information. Now, However, I have had this conversation with clients as to whether they should apply one set of rules to U.S. data, U.S. personal data, and another set of rules to EU personal data. And the answer in many cases is it's operationally too difficult to apply two different sets of rules. So we have clients that apply the European rules to all of the data that they process. 
And that's also bearing in mind that this EU-based company would have to comply with the security provisions and DPIAs and DPO, all the other obligations of the GDPR. And is there a distinction here between um, buying goods and services versus selling goods and services? So, for example, if a U.S. company um, purchases goods from a person in the EU and as part of that transaction, the U.S. company receives personal data. So, for example, a contact name and email address. Since the U.S. person is purchasing, not selling from the EU, um, is that U.S. person caught within the GDPR? So that's a that's a good one for highlighting the distinction between buying and selling. If you're simply buying goods from uh, from Europe, you're not going to draw your organization within the remit of the GDPR. But it goes back to that offer of goods or services. If there is an offer of goods or services to individuals in Europe, then you could be on the hook for GDPR if you meet that if if you meet the extraterritorial uh, applicability criteria. And one final hypothetical on this one, just covering all the bases. Um, so in this one, you've got a U.S. company um, that does not have a presence in the EU. They don't advertise in the EU. Um, any of the other sets of examples that you have up there as far as website being in an EU language, um, EU telephone numbers, et cetera, they don't do any of that. Um, but they receive an unsolicited purchase order from a an EU person. Does that transaction then fall under the GDPR to the extent that personal data is exchanged as part of it? Got it. So it's a US-based organization. So if that US-based organization doesn't envisage offering goods or services to individuals in Europe and there is this ad hoc provision of goods or services, there's unlikely to be significant risk there. And I would say, you know, while there's no bright line, there, I would say that they're likely not to be caught by the GDPR. Now, the extent to which this becomes a pattern of activity, that they're, you know, engaging in uh, more and more business with Europe, I think there's a point at which the momentum builds up and you really have to consider whether you're, you're processing such a volume of European data that you need to take under consideration whether you should comply with the provisions of the GDPR. So the next topic that we wanted to talk about is the one that is uh, the reason the GDPR has been on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. So this little European data law has made front, front page news in the US and the reason is because there are very significant fines for non-compliance. Um, and I'm sure everyone's heard the big scary numbers that it for infringement of certain principles of the GDPR, there can be fines of up to 4% of annual worldwide turnover or 20 million euros, whichever whichever is higher. And there are three different tiers of fines and you, you more often hear about the 4% number, uh, 20 million euros, because that's the, the highest band, but there are three different tiers. So many of our um, listeners today, I believe are with worldwide global companies. Um, so as far as what constitutes worldwide turnover, um, is it just looking at the turnover of the violating entity, or does it look at the whole group of companies from a, for a global company? Right. So this is a topic on which there is a fair amount of confusion, but the European Commission, the Article 29 Working Party, which is the European supervisory body made up of all the different uh, supervisory authorities of each of each member state issued some guidance on this point and made it clear that the fines will apply to the revenue of the whole group. So not just the subsidiary that infringed the law, but the revenue of the whole group. And it will look at whether the subsidiaries are, if they're 100 percent owned by the parent company, there is a um, rebuttal, rebuttable presumption of control over that entity, and they will be considered a singular and, uh, undertaking for the purposes of assessing fines under the under the GDPR. So, I think you know, I I've highlighted the how significant these fines are, but I think one thing that people lose sight of, or our clients have lost sight of, is that we take the view that the 4% or the higher the higher fine 
will really only be applied if there is an egregious breach of the law. It's going to be, we think, we haven't seen any enforcement, obviously, yet, but we think it will really be reserved for um, really e exceptional breaches of the law. And then I, I also point out that Article 83 of the GDPR provides that the fines need to be effective, proportionate, and dissuasive. And the regulator is bound to take con into consideration the nature, gravity, and duration of the infringement, uh, the intentional or negligent character of the infringement, and any actions taken by the controller or processor to mitigate the damage suffered by the data subjects. And this brings us to another topic that I'll, t I'll speak to a little bit more later, which is accountability. And the extent to which you can, you're able to demonstrate that you have been taking steps to comply with the GDPR, that you've undertaken a GDPR compliance exercise, will go some way to making sure that when a regulator has to assess a fine, that uh, you have a good story to tell. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the seven data protection principles, and these are somewhat similar to the principles that were enshrined in the data protection directive. So lawfulness, fairness, and transparency, and this is really that personal data processing has to be lawful. You have to establish a lawful basis of processing, and that manner of processing has to be transparent to the data subject. Purpose limitation, so organizations should only collect data uh, for a specified, explicit, and legitimate purpose. And then after collecting the data, making sure that any additional personal data processing is conducted in accordance with the purposes. Data minimization. And this one, we I hear a lot of people talking about, and they say, oh, data minimization is just in our policy. But it's actually one of the, along with storage limitation, it's one of the harder ones for organizations to comply with because it's really about ensuring that all the ways in which you collect personal data are adequate, relevant, and limited to what is necessary for the purposes for which data, personal data is being processed. And that goes sort of hand in hand with the storage limitation. You can't hold on to data forever. You have to identify why you're keeping, you have to have a, a, reason, for, uh, a reason for holding on to it uh, after it's um, primary purposes is passed. Now, accuracy is another principle. Data, personal data has to be kept accurate and up to date. Again, this is another one that people think, oh, well, it's in our overarching GDPR policy. We talk about this, but it's really operationalizing this to ensure that where an individual has asked for data to be corrected, that measures are taken, there's a process within, within the organization to ensure that data is kept accurate. Integrity and confidentiality, so security measures, um, personal data processing has to ensure appropriate security, um, and accountability, which is the cornerstone of the GDPR, and it's really about demonstrating compliance with all of these different principles. And the way to demonstrate compliance with respect to all of these different principles are some of the things that we've uh, been talking about, so entering into data processing agreements, Having appropriate policies, uh, having appropriate policies and procedures in place, as well. Another thing that is expanded under the GDPR is the rights of data subjects. So these rights existed in in a uh, more limited form under the Data Protection Directive, but under the GDPR, data subjects have enhanced rights. Um, so they have the right to access information that an organization holds about them. They have a right to have that information corrected, um, a right in certain circumstances to have the information erased. This is what is sometimes referred to as the right to be forgotten, right to restrict data processing, the right to data portability, which is where an individual can request that their data is transferred to a, a third a third party organization and the right to object to data processing. And the way that these rights are provided to individuals, people ask, well, how do I enshrine these, these data subject rights in my, in my practices? And the, the key way to do so, you have to be telling individuals that they have these rights. So one way is on your website privacy policy, showing that you have included a relevant paragraph in relation to data subjects' rights.
in an internal privacy policy, so a policy applicable to employees, uh, that employees have these rights as well. And then ensuring that any overarching GDPR policy um, makes it clear that there that these rights are enshrined in uh, in the external facing privacy policy, the HR privacy policy. And then what we've done for clients is to create an individual rights policy, which sets out the processes the, and procedures that will occur when the organization receives a right of erasure or a right to access who has to be activated within the organization to collect this information and ensure that it's getting back to the individual within the 30-day time limit. So privacy notice, and this is, um, the privacy notice is a really critical part of GDPR compliance. It's the one place that um, organizations, competitor organizations, your customers, or regulators can immediately look and see if you've done anything for GDPR compliance. So the things, the features that have to be included in a privacy notice are enshrined in Articles 13 and 14 of the GDPR. And the privacy notice has to set out who the data controller is, so the name of the relevant organization. You have to disclose if you have a data protection officer, uh, the details of the data protection officer, you have to set out your lawful basis of processing um, and if it's consent or if it's legitimate interest. The features with uh, how the organization complies with cross-border data transfer, data retention periods, these individual rights, so the right to correct, erase, restrict the processing of personal data, the right to lodge a complaint with the supervisory authority, uh, and uh, another example is the any logic for automated decision decision making. So you mention up here um, data retention period is one of the things that has to be in the privacy notice. Would um, regulatory record keeping requirements, for example, uh, under U.S. Customs laws, you've got to maintain uh, documents and information for five years. Same is true for the Federal Maritime Commission. Um, is that a justification for establishing the length of time for your data retention period? That's the first question. And then the second question is, do you have to state what that justification is in your privacy policy? Got it. Okay. So the on the first point, is whether you can keep records for if required by law, and the answer is a resounding yes. And there's, there's good news and bad news on document retention. The good news is that the GDPR's requirements on data retention are, for a change, not that complicated or difficult to understand. And the directive and the privacy laws of other companies, uh, countries, so Canada's PIPEDA, have also required that data not be retained or processed for longer than the minimum necessary. The GDPR's data retention requirements implement the use limitation principle, um, so to keep personal data only so long as necessary to fulfill the original basis for collecting and processing the information and not any longer than that. And you're permitted to keep the data if it's required by, required by law. So if you need to keep the data for tax purposes or uh, for customs purposes, you're allowed to do so. Uh, another another thing that I get asked about uh, quite a lot is with respect to contracts. So uh, people ask what the data retention period should be for contracts. And the general answer to that is the statutory limitation period for bringing a claim under contracts, at least in the UK, is six years. So we'll say six to seven years for retaining those contracts. Um, so the, the bad news is that, as I mentioned briefly earlier, it's this is one of the harder tenets of the GDPR to comply with. Organizations you know, have a tendency to want to hold on to all the information that they have, and you have to be dis disciplined in discarding information that is no longer being used or you no longer have a lawful basis on which to, to keep it for. One, one quick follow-up question on that point. If when we're talking about data retention, these policies again only apply to EU personal data, right? So if a company wanted to retain personal data on a US person for a longer period of time, they could do that. It might be operationally difficult, but but they could retain it longer. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. 
And as to whether this needs to be stated in the privacy policy, we take the view that you don't have to enclose your entire document retention policy. And some organizations have said that that is, in some cases, it's almost a, a trade secret that how long they keep certain data. So in order to comply with the, however, in order to comply with the transparency guidelines set out by the European Commission, we recommend including in the privacy notice at least exemplar examples of what your data retention periods are, and then or maybe a line about if the individual wants additional information on data retention periods, they can, you know, for example, contact the, the data protection officer. Um, I think another thing about your question of whether, you know, an organization should have different uh, policies with respect to EU and U.S. data goes to that uh, concept I was talking about earlier, which is how difficult is it to apply two different sets of rules to the data? If it's going to be operationally difficult to do, then organizations might consider applying that, in many cases, higher standard of the GDPR uh, to personal data that it processes, whether that personal data is of an EU individual or, or not. So an, another thing that I talk to clients end up talking a lot about is the lawful basis of processing. And this is it's just a really different principle from the, the U.S. approach to personal, the processing of personal data. And the default position in Europe is that you can't process any personal data unless you've established a lawful basis of processing. Um, and I know that oftentimes we, we hear a lot about consent being one of the lawful bases of processing, but there are a number of different ones that I think organizations need to think about when trying to establish the relevant lawful basis of, of processing. So with respect to consent, this is, it's the same similar concept to what existed under the directive, but the GDPR sets a higher bar for achieving consent from an individual. There's no more implied consent. You can't have pre-tick boxes. Their silence or inactivity are not considered consent. It has to be a clear, the individual has to provide a clear affirmative act, such as ticking a box. There are other examples of what can constitute a clear affirmative act, but consent has to be specific, informed, freely given, and unambiguous. Um, and I think that's definitely worth thinking about because a lot of organizations tend to rely on consent as their lawful basis. So as to as to other lawful bases of processing, there's contract performance, and this is an alternative to consent, and it's where the processing of the personal data is necessary for the performance of a contract to which the data subject is party. And the example that's often given of this is where you make a booking at a hotel and the hotel needs the name of the individual and their contact details in order to hold the room. Um, and then another lawful basis of processing that's sort of more, not as well understood is called legitimate interest. And this is another alternative to consent as a basis for processing. If the processing is necessary for the purposes of the legitimate interest pursued by the controller or by a third party, unless those interests are rid overridden by the rights and freedoms of the data subject. So there's a balancing test here. And the GDPR provides explicit examples of where you can rely on legitimate interest. And there's a lot of discussion as to how broadly these sort of exceptions can be interpreted. So the GDPR mentions fraud prevention, um, transfers within a group of affiliated companies for internal admin purposes, and direct marketing purposes. Um, so I think, you know, all of those you need to really consider very carefully before deciding that you've, you, you can use legitimate interest as your lawful basis of, of processing. So I think it's very important here um, for, for this audience, for this industry that we're talking about to highlight contract performance. Um, obviously, if a, a transportation company is engaged to provide transportation, there is a contract of carriage that's in place. Um, so therefore, the data that's being gathered to effectuate that transportation would fall under this contract performance um, lawful basis. With regards to legitimate interests, um, you mentioned that there's a, a balancing test. 
if the legitimate interest is based on, again, a disclosure required by law, so for example, um, a customs entry for imports into the United States or AES filings for, for exports from the U.S., does that re law legal requirement constitute a legitimate basis on its own? Do you need to conduct the balancing test when you're relying on that type of basis? Mm -hmm. So there are a few different there are a few different things here. So there's the contract performance, but there's also another part of the and these lawful bases of processing are set out in Article Six of the GDPR. And one of the lawful bases, which I think is probably relevant here, is where the processing is necessary for compliance with a legal obligation to which the controller is subject. And that's likely to be the case where that information in your in the, in the shipping and logistics industry context has to be disclosed to, to the customs agent or in the context of that transaction. I would say that it's pretty safe to rely on you know, necessary for compliance with a legal with a legal obligation in those circumstances, but it's certainly useful to take a look at all the different lawful bases of processing set out in Article Six and see where the activity falls and whether there is a different ground on which you can rely. And the reason I say that is because there tends to be this default. Um, sort of knee-jerk reaction that, oh, we should just rely on consent for everything because that's what we've heard a lot about. And I think that's, um, you know, not, necessary, not necessarily useful for the organization. Where the lawful basis of the processing can be contract performance or it can be where the, it's necessary for compliance with the legal obligation, those are probably preferable grounds on which to rely. Circling back for a second to the, the privacy policy, you mentioned that the lawful basis has to be stated in the privacy policy. If a company's relying on, on various lawful bases, mm -hmm. so contract performance in the event of a contract or um, the legal requirement, would they list all of those bases in the privacy policy? That's a great question. And yes, the, the answer is you should be as specific as possible in the privacy notice and set out what lawful basis of, of processing you're relying upon with respect to each processing activity. And it's, you know, that's going to be a really important, again, message to the regulator that you've thought about it, you've gone through the analysis as to where your processing activities fall and what the relevant lawful basis of processing is. Um, so I, that's a great question. And yes, the privacy notice should be explicit as to which lawful basis you're, of processing you're relying upon. So I talked a little bit earlier about um, data processing agreements, and this is a you know a new provision under the newish provision under under the GDPR, and the responsibility is primarily set out in Articles 26 and Article 20, uh, 28 of the GDPR, and it's Article 28 enshr enshrines all of the different features that have to be included in an agreement between data controllers and data processors. Um, and that's why I know a lot of organizations have just shipped out their DPA form. So you may be receiving these, especially in the coming weeks. Um, there was some hope that these would have gone out earlier <laughs> and not just two weeks before the deadline. But I, you know, in all honesty, I, I don't know anyone that has totally completed their data processing agreement exercise. Um, I think another thing that I, I think is really important to think about here is we see a lot of data processing agreements being used by organizations to sort of land grab their sort of expanded scope that's included in the agreement and it's sort of uh, put under the aegis of, oh, we have to do this to comply with the GDPR, but they, they put, are pushing through a few additional obligations that may not be required by the law. So it's really important to take a look at Article 28 and, and number one, see whether those provisions are actually required by the law. And then number two, there are features that can go you know, one way or another in the data processing agreement. And a good example of that is uh, the Article 28 requires um, the controller to be able to audit the data processor. From the data controller's perspective, they're gonna include a line in the DPA that says, 
we may audit you data processor at any time. We can have access to your facilities and documents, systems, and personnel in order to conduct our audit. Um, now, the audit language is required to be included in the agreement, from it, but from a data processor's perspective, you're going to want to say, well, um, fine, we understand that we have to include an audit provision. However, we will allow you to do so only once per year upon a mutually agreed upon auditor. Uh, you can only have access to information that's relevant to this data processing agreement, and it's going to be at your expense. So those are the kind of commercial terms that sort of surround the terms that have to be included under a data processing agreement. And the other key feature, and this is something that I get a lot of questions about, is the liability and indemnity package. And this is another area in which there tends to be a little bit of scope creep. And one of the things that we say to clients is, well, look at your master services agreement or whatever agreement you have with the counterparty and see whether you've already negotiated a liability or indemnity package um, that you, know, you don't want to renegotiate, which is a really fair point. Uh, another thing that we talk to clients about in this liability and indemnity package is it's hard to know what the, there's no market practice that has arisen around caps because maybe it will in the next 12 to 18 months, but there's nothing now. Nobody knows what enforcement is going to look like exactly. Um, so when we, when I talk to clients about how to negotiate this sort of uncertainty, especially when it's a really big question about risk, is looking at what the real risks are. So is, it, is there any sensitive data at issue? Is there any health data? Is there any financial data? Do you have insurance? And does the counterparty have any insurance that would help cabin your risk a little bit? And these are really critical questions that will come into the whole risk matrix around the liability and indemnity package and enable you to negotiate a, a level of risk that you're, that you're comfortable with. So with regard to the DPAs, um, I'm, I'm curious about the responsibility of third parties that are not directly subject to the GDPR. Um, so for example, if you've got a, um, a U.S. customs broker, they're engaged by the U.S. importer, um, so they are not subject to the GDPR in themselves, but they are receiving um, EU personal data from the transportation company or from the U.S. Um, importer. Does that company have an obligation to enter into a DPA? So there's that's a really good question, and the, the answer is you have to look at whether the controller, the data controller in this in the chain of parties is caught by the GDPR. And if they are, there's going to be a chain of contracts that's going to require each processor and subprocessor to comply with the provisions of that data processing agreement. So it's really important to look at how each party functions in the chain and what they're doing with the data. So I uh, wanted to touch briefly on uh, new security requirements under the GDPR. And it, this is a really, I, I get a lot of questions about this, and that's because the GDPR does not provide a lot of specificity. It says things like you should, you organization should Im, impose appropriate technical and organizational security measures. And clients say, well, what does that mean? <laughs> and the answer is some of the things to look at are, what is the nature and volume of data that you're processing? What are the standards in your industry? Is it standard for uh, organizations to encrypt data at rest and in transit? Um, so really looking to industry standards. Some organizations believe that if they comply with ISO 27001 or if they've done a SOC 2 audit, then they're fine. And that's not necessarily true. And I think you really need to go through your, the, the, I think the basis from which you make that determination is slightly different. You need to look at the nature and volume of the data and whether the measures that you're applying, technical and organizational measures you're applying to that data are appropriate given, given the circumstances. Uh, another key change related to security is data breach notification. Uh, and this is a, this is a big change because Europe hasn't had a, really wide data breach notification obligations. There were 
um, there are existing obligations for electronic communication service providers, but never across the board. So this is going to be a new one for European organizations to have these obligations to notify the supervisory authority if there is a data breach that requires notification not later than 72 hours after becoming aware of the breach. Um, and in certain circumstances, individuals also have to be notified. Um, and does the notification um, have to be direct to consumers or can it be a posting on a company's website, for example? So our, we think the best practice is to uh, provide that notification direct to consumers. Um, data controllers have to, for example, communicate the name and contact details of the data protection officer and other contact point where more information can be obtained, describe the circumstance, the likely consequences of the personal data breach, and describe the measures taken or that are proposed to be taken by the controller to address the personal data breach, including where appropriate measures to mitigate its, its possible adverse, adverse effects. Our next topic, um, which is really relevant to this industry, is uh, cross-border data transfer. And from a very high level, it, again, it differs from the U.S. really fundamentally because they're, in Europe, you're not allowed to transfer any data outside of Europe unless there is a legal mechanism in place to legitimize that transfer. Uh, and so the one that everyone's heard about is, uh, is the privacy shield, um, the EU-U.S. and Swiss-U.S. privacy shield. So if you are in, in Europe, you can freely transfer personal data to an organization that's self-certified to the privacy shield. And the other one that's most common, commonly used is the standard contractual clauses. And these are a set of contract clauses that are prescribed by the European Commission. They can't really be changed. They can be sort of supplemented, but if you change the substance, if you change them, then there is a question as to whether they will remain enforceable. Binding corporate rules. So this is a set of intergroup uh, intergroup rules uh, that would apply to uh, only to an organization, and they're generally considered to be sort of costly and um, time consuming to implement. And they really only help you uh, for intergroup data transfers. They don't protect you for transfers outside of the organization. There are a number of countries that have received an adequacy decision. So the European Commission has made a determination that certain countries provide an adequate level of security to personal data. And this includes countries like Guernsey, Jersey, the Isle of Man, Israel, Canada, Uruguay, for example. So you can freely transfer data to those countries. Uh, if you get the consent of the individual, you can transfer their data or if it's necessary for the performance of the contract. And I think that's probably really relevant to, to this crowd. So you mentioned briefly um, intra-company, intra-group transfers. If, for example, um, an EU branch office sells transportation services to somebody, to a, an EU person, um, but then they need to transfer the personal data, name, address, et cetera, to their invoicing group, which is for example, based in a, a different country, a third country. Would that be a scenario where you would recommend having binding corporate rules in place, or could a company simply rely on the contract performance justification? Got it. So the binding corporate rules, if it is a very large organization and has many different subsidiaries all over the world, we will sometimes recommend that binding corporate rules are worthwhile to pursue. Um, but in, this, in these circumstances, if the invoicing, I think you would have to look at whether where the invoicing group was, was based. Mm -hmm. If it was based in one of those countries that's received an adequacy decision, then you're, you, know, you can freely transfer data there. But it sounds like I, I can see an argument here that this transfer is necessary for the performance of a contract with the individual. Um, so it's helpful to take a look at Article 49 of the GDPR to see if any of the derogations uh, would apply. So we wanted to talk a little bit about what are the things an organization should, you know, we know that there are only two weeks left before the GDPR comes into force. And I think it's really useful to talk about if you haven't done anything for the GDPR, 
where should you start and and what what should you what should you be focusing on and we think that the looking at your privacy notice your external facing privacy notice is a really great place to start because that's the point uh, that's the place where a regulator can take a look and see pretty quickly whether you've done anything for GDPR your competitors can take a look your customers can take a look and and you know in, individuals can uh, can check really quickly and see whether you've done anything for GDPR compliance the thing that we also recommend, and it is really uh, time consuming, it can be really time consuming, but it helps to really inform the GDPR compliance exercise, is to conduct a, a data audit. So going through and looking at your organization and figuring out where all the data is held, where it's transferred within the organization, whether it's transferred outside of Europe, what the lawful basis of processing of that, of that data is, once you've documented all of those things, which is required under Article 30, the rest of your GDPR compliance exercise in some ways flows from that data mapping, that, that uh, data record of processing exercise, because you'll know where you have to think about cross-border data transfer. You'll figure out how data or moves around the organization, um, and it's a good cornerstone of any global privacy compliance program just something when organizations are thinking about, you know, whether to do it, it's it's really we think it's really critical from uh, a global perspective as well as a GDPR perspective to conduct that data audit and just figure out where all of where all of the data sits in in the organization. Well, thank you very much, Shannon. I think this was um, incredibly useful, and we hope that um, you all found this helpful as well. Uh, we are out of time. We do have a couple of questions um, which we will respond directly to. Um, you'll also see up on the screen um, our emails. So to the extent that you have any additional questions, if you're um, looking to get a privacy policy in place and you'd like some advice on the privacy policy, if you receive um, a DPA and you're not quite sure what to do with it, you haven't seen one before, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd be happy to, to help you. Thank you again. Thanks so much.